Hello, I'm Rana Kabir, a first year medical student here at the University of Michigan Medical School. I'm here today with revered cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Robert Bartlett. Dr. Bartlett has had a long and illustrious career here at the University of Michigan Medical School, where he has practiced for over 30 years. He is known for his warmth, his tireless work ethic, and his endless innovative mind that has brought to us contributions to the field of intensive care, including the development of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO, used to save kids and adults with cardiac and respiratory failure around the world. Join me as I sit down with Dr. Bartlett and ask him about his journey to medicine and the challenges that arise with developing any big idea, as well as any advice he may have to offer anyone looking to make an impact in the field of healthcare. You know, what inspired you to pursue medicine in general? Well, it's a good question. My dad is a surgeon, and although I, he didn't push me into it, he, uh, I could see his lifestyle and what he did, and uh, what I actually wanted to do out of high school was to be a professional hockey player, but I could see that wasn't going to happen, or a professional musician, that wasn't going to happen, uh, and the next uh, option was something in science, and that drew me into medicine. Uh, John Gibbon was a surgeon who invented the heart-lung machine, and uh, it all stemmed from a patient he was taking care of in the 20s who had a massive pulmonary embolism, and the patient died. And he, and he wrote down in a subsequent paper, it naturally occurred to me that there should be some way to take blood out of the right side of the heart and perfuse it into the left side, which led to all of cardiopulmonary bypass and all of heart surgery all that sort of all, all of ECMO for that matter. But I always uh, quote that sentence, uh, it naturally occurred to me that we ought to be able to do this. Because the, if you're a doctor, that happens every day, five or six times a day. It occurred to me we ought to be able to solve rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or cancer of the this or that or common cold, whatever it is. Every day we see dozens of things that are unanswered questions, there's a, there are a lot more problems than there are solutions. You know, you're very famous for, uh, in 1975, treating uh, the first newborn with ECMO to be saved by ECMO. Is that correct? That was true, but uh, that research started in about 1965 mm -hmm. in Boston uh, when I was a junior resident and we were just uh, working on congenital heart surgery in the very early days the mortality on those children was about 50%. And we realized that if they could just live two or three more days, they'd be okay most of the time. So we uh, wondered why we couldn't just use the heart-lung machine, which was a new device at the time, for days at a time. Well, of course, it was lethal for a couple of hours at a time. So we set out to determine why that was, how to solve that problem. And so it was just driven by that clinical problem of wanting to keep patients alive for a few days while we could figure out what was going wrong and hopefully do something about it. And the beginning of all that research began that way. So we started the animal studies in Boston at Harvard in, in the 60s. Uh, in 1970, another resident buddy and I from the Brigham moved to California to a brand new medical school. And it turned out to be a great experience, as it turns out. There was no one there to say, you can't do that. So we uh, got into an old county hospital. It had some empty space in the back. We set up a laboratory. And we began the study of long-term extracorporeal support in animals, mostly in sheep. And uh, while we were doing that, patients came up. And we tried out this apparatus on, on various patients. Our first successful case was in 19... 72, a little boy that we had operated on and fixed his heart, but he was having heart failure afterward. And we brought our machine over and hooked it up, it worked quite well. So we did several other cases. 1975, we had the first successful newborn case, which turned out to be really an important one because that group of patients turned out to be the group where this technique worked very well uh, and really developed the technique over the next decade or so. After your first newborn successfully treated uh, in 75, did you feel that you had solved the issue? You know, it just occurred well, to you we, and then... Of course, but yeah. we knew it before because we knew yeah. we could do it in animals and we had our earlier cardiac patient mm -hmm. I talked about. So uh, once we knew, okay, now we can keep 
people alive with no heart or lung function for a few days, once you see that happen once, then you say, oh, okay, well, this, this could happen all the time. It's just a matter of working on the details from this point. What inspired you to get involved with that kind of work? I mean, was it Well, just uh, taking care of patients. Yeah. Uh, I was at the Children's Hospital in Boston. The chief of the service was Robert E. Gross, arguably the most important surgeon of the last century. Uh, and we were in the very early days of cardiac surgery for children. Gross was an absolute master at it. Uh, so uh, it was surprising when patients didn't do well following operation. It was all related to time on the heart-lung machine. So we just set out to see what the cause of the problem was and then try to solve it. Yeah. So it, it was almost like a, like a thread you just kind of noticed and started pulling on instead of just a big idea that, you know, some people I know in medical school say, you know, today I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to solve this exact problem. Yeah. Well, know? I don't know anyone who's ever Done. I know a lot of people who said that. Don't know never anyone who's ever done it, yeah. uh, because say, I'd like to cure cancer. I'd like sure. to cure blindness. I'd like to cure diabetes. Whatever. Sure. Wouldn't we all? But that's a little grandiose. Mm -hmm. Much better to say I, I have an idea on this. And it all has to begin with a clinical problem. It begins with a specific patient who's failing for some reason, and you think you know someone ought to be able to fix that. What kind of hurdles have you faced, you know, in, in doing this and how did you solve them? How did you overcome them? Well, uh, <laughs> the, the, the hurdles are many, but they're all solvable. Uh, the, uh, the first is hospital administration. Think about this, all this kind of stuff that I'm talking about is all has to do in hospitals. So uh, the people who run hospitals, whether they're universities or private groups or for-profit groups are in business. So they, they can't undertake something unless they can figure out how to pay for it. So that's, that's a perennial problem in a big university or in a little private community hospital or at the Mayo Clinic or wherever you are. So uh, someone has to decide, okay, this might be a valuable thing to pursue. Uh, let's figure out a way to pay for it, hoping that two or three years down the road, in fact, it'll be a money maker, but that's, uh, but that's the first consideration of the hospital administrator. So you need hospital administrators uh, who have that vision. You have to spend money to make money. We're here to take care of patients, not necessarily to make money, although if you don't make money, your hospital doesn't, doesn't last very long. So the whole business side of it is one thing. Uh, the other thing is the... Uh, concern over doing something that's invasive, expensive, radical to take care of patients, keeping someone on a ventilator overnight or continuous electrocardiogram monitoring seems easy now, but at the time people said, why would you want to do that? And in fact, it might be risky to patients, especially with this invasive procedure that's called ECMO. Uh, most of the practicing community thought this is crazy. Do you know what that guy in California is doing? Putting babies on this complicated machine and they're all going to bleed to death and it's a terrible thing. They just shouldn't be doing it. So the, the practicing community, even the academic community, is very reluctant to, to buy into any kind of new procedure, especially if they didn't think of it. Well, what goes through your mind when, you know, <clears throat> you're taking these risks? Like, is there yeah, nervousness, confidence, you know, Fear, certainly all these, all no, these things. Certainly not fear or nervousness. I mean, you're just taking care of patients. So you do whatever you need to do to, to take care of people. And, and I'm a surgeon. So oftentimes that involves doing a major operation, major intervention of some type. But that's why surgeons are surgeons. That's the way we are. You don't want a surgeon who comes in the night before your operation saying, we're going to do your operation tomorrow. I hope it goes well. I'm going to get some sleep. I've read up. and I've done a bunch of these. And it usually goes OK. You don't want that. You want someone to come in and say, OK, we're doing your operation tomorrow. It's going to solve your problem. You're going to be great. You're going to be home in a week. Any questions? And that's the way we think. That's the way you have to think. If you can't think that way, you shouldn't be a surgeon. You know, I, I think what I'm learning in medicine is you're, you're working towards uh, giving people a chance at life. You know, essentially, like you're, you're, it's not necessarily about cutting in this or saving this, but you're saving, preserving the family, preserving their, you know, their livelihood, essentially, and what they can do. Of course, that's right. So we've been talking about this ECMO 
procedure, but it really is just a very small part of where most of my career has been sent, which is the development of what's now called critical care or intensive care. When I graduated from medical school, there was no such thing. There was no ICU, there was no ICU nurse, there was no way to keep a patient on a ventilator overnight, for example. And all of that grew up during my career. So that now it's a full-fledged specialty with boards and textbooks and experts and, and uh, that sort of thing. And I ran the surgical ICU here for 25 years when I was practicing. But that entire field of uh, having a place and a group of people just to take care of really sick people is, is a new phenomenon all in the last 40 years or so. Uh, and it's, it's remarkably effective, actually. Can you give us a taste of what it's like to, to build something like that, something you know, essentially from, from scratch, you know, you're saying that critical care doesn't well, exist. Well, it, it's much like everything else we've been talking about. It's just a matter of taking care of one sick patient after another. So the original uh, ICU, in my experience, was at the uh, Brigham Hospital in Boston, where we were just starting with cardiac surgery. And there would be patients who'd be so sick that they could not be extubated. So they had to be on the ventilator overnight. That was wild stuff at the time. So they would spend that night in the recovery room. And by the time there were two or three or four of those patients, there was no place to put the patients for the next day's operation. So we built a little addition to the recovery room and that became a whole different room in the hospital, which became the first ICU. And uh, similar things were happening elsewhere. The first cardiac ICU was at the Brigham because one of the very entrepreneurial cardiologist said, you know, there ought to be a way to monitor the EKG continuously. Unprecedented at the time. Wow, that was really a wild thing to do. Turned out that when you did that, you found that people who had heart attacks, had arrhythmias, and died of arrhythmia. So the whole concept of coronary care units, for example, just came out of some guy, his name was Bernie Lown, who said, you know, I bet we could learn a lot by just having continuous electric cardiac. He also invented the defibrillator. So was a pretty accomplished guy, but he didn't set out to do that. He just set out to take care of patients in his charge. Why did you choose to come back to Michigan? Well, I went to Michigan Medical School. I graduated in 63 and was out in Boston and then in Southern California for 17 years, actually. I decided to leave there in 1980 and had a series of options and chose to come back to Michigan. Turned out to be a great choice because the infrastructure for clinical practice, clinical research, and especially laboratory research is just great at Michigan. And that's been a big uh, important factor in, in my career here. The research infrastructure here is so remarkably good. Most people who are here at Michigan don't realize how good it is, but there's a whole building full of people whose only job is to make it easy for the faculty to get grants, keep grants, and, and manage the money and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and groups of people whose whole career is devoted to making that happen. So having been at Harvard and at University of California, I can tell you their infrastructure is nothing like it is here, which is one reason why we're, as an institution, so successful in getting research funding for biomedical projects and for any kind of projects, it applies in engineering and all the other, all the other disciplines. So that helped a lot. Uh, the second factor was this great big hospital with a continuous stream of very sick patients. This particular procedure is only used for people who are dying acutely of heart and lung failure. And uh, fortunately or otherwise, a lot of those patients are here. Uh, so uh, the, the whole clinical infrastructure uh, was has been built to make that kind of thing happen, to have progressive clinical research underway. So if you have a new drug or a new widget or a new procedure, uh, this is a great place to undertake that and evaluate. You know, once you're in this kind of pipeline of going into medicine, you start thinking bigger ideas of, you know, what am I going to leave behind? What is my legacy going to be? I'm sure you've thought about that I several times. I never thought about that at all. <laughs> I didn't even think about it to this day. So well, what do you, I mean, what you, do you can't mean? think about legacy. You're just thinking about what am I doing today? Well, who do I have to operate on next week? Can I take good care of my patients? Can I keep the lab running? So I like that. That's very interesting because I, I would have thought like, I guess at some point you would have thought to yourself, you know, what am I leaving 
behind what is what are you know because you've you've done so many great things. Well, but it it, it looks like that in retrospect, but yes. it never looks like that going forward. Some of my friends who are really very prominent researchers, if you ask them the same question, what did you do to get here to the, this, win the Nobel Prize, and some of my mentors did, and so on. We never think about that. You just think about, I've, I've got sick patients, I've taken care of them, I'm doing the best I can, moving ahead day by day. So, so how it looks, looking back on it, uh, if you're successful, looking back on it, it sounds like this brilliant career. Well, I did this and this and this and this, but it's never that way. It's just I'm moving ahead a little bit. Gee, if it happens to work out, then 30 years later, it looks like it was brilliant research. <laughs> yeah, when you put it down on paper in one solid form, I guess it looks at the end. Better. Yeah, but that, you don't write that down at the beginning. No one plans that. I'm right. just just doing what I do as a doctor. That's all you think about. Well, I guess at this point, then, since you've had some time to think about that, you know, giant piece of paper resume you have, what do you think is your you know, biggest contribution to the world of medicine. Yeah, well, I get asked that a lot. Of course, that's very easy because it's yeah. all those students and residents and fellows and colleagues that I have trained over time, or at least they worked in my lab, worked with me clinically, learned how to do all the things that we do, plus a lot of other things. Uh, so there are thousands of really good doctors out there. Some of them are in research, some are not. But that's far and away the most important thing that, that I've done, as is true of any faculty member here.